Hello, everybody, and uh, welcome to the GOSH Grand Rounds. Um, so um, if you don't know, my name is Jonathan Smith. I'm the Deputy Director of Medical Education at GOSH and a consultant pediatric anaesthetist. So uh, just a note of a few questions, I think, at the big briefing and in last week's Grand Rounds is that you can get, you can view the previous Grand Rounds as they get edited and uploaded on the internal GOSH Gold um, virtual learning environment. Um, and you can also look at them via the uh, GLA, so the, the Great Wall Street Learning Academy's YouTube channel, which is via YouTube, if that's externally. So anybody can see those if you'd like to look at them. As before, we can tell you that the RCPCH, as you can self credit if you want CPD points for these grand rounds. Uh, so before I introduce Sapner, um, and a team from John Hopkins Hospital in Baltimore. Um, we are very excited to have got our first overseas speaker on our Grand Rounds. Um, so far, we've had people from in the, in, within the UK. Um, so this is a first for us. Um, and doing it virtually, of course, is fantastic. So it's very early in the morning for them in the States. So thank you very much to Satander for getting up and, and getting herself onto our Grand Rounds. Um, now, the title of the presentation is Social Media for Medical Education. Are you ready to take, are you ready to be a Twitter attrition? I knew I was going to fall over that. Um, and so because this is all about um, social media uh, and for education, we thought we'd do a poll before we go to Sapna um, to see how many of us got social media accounts and how, much, how many of us are active on social media. So, Sherry, have you got a poll ready that we can put up for people to see? Oh, there we go. As if by magic. So if you can tick on these things, do you have a do you have any type of social media account, personal or professional? I can't imagine many people don't have that anymore. Let's see if that's working. There we go. So almost everybody has a social media account. So 97%. So this is relevant to almost everybody. Question two: Do you use social media, Twitter, Facebook, etc., professionally for medical education, research, networking? and will keep updated with current medical developments. So we know almost everybody has an account. Now let's see when the results are in, what people use it for. Okay, so, so I'd say about 50-50, isn't it? So that's about 43% rarely or never use it for professionally um, having an account and other people do, okay. So almost everybody has an account and about half of you use it professionally, keeping up to date. The third question. Okay, so during the current pandemic, what has been your main source of medical information? So the Royal Colleges, social media, hospital internal med messaging, newspaper news channels or other. That's going to be interesting to see what people think. Right. Okay, so a real mixed bunch there, isn't there, really? So only 30% of people, interestingly, go to the Royal, Royal College official sources, um, hospital internal things, but quite a lot of people. So, yeah, so newspapers and social media. So what you would say is unofficial channels are actually, what, 30, 40% of people are getting their um, information from that. Great, thank you very much. Okay, so what I think we'll do is we'll go on with the main talk now. So um, I'm just going to introduce Satna Kujakar, who is a, um, an associate professor of anesthesiology and paediatric critical medicine at John Hopkins Hospital in the United States of America. She has, had, has an interest in rehabilitation and sleep during critical care stays for children, and she's the director of the PICU UP program. Um, which um, if you want to see some really good videos, uh, she's done a TED talk about that as well, which is really inspirational about how we're getting children mobilised very early on uh, during their critical care illness and their stay on intensive care units. And that's fantastic. Um, and of course, the reason why we've asked her to come and speak to us here is because uh, she's got a huge interest in social media. Um, and a lot of her research is in social media as well. And she's the vice chair for research and anesthesia and pediatric critical medicine at John Cotton Hospital. Um, and she's the social media editor for pediatric critical care medicine, which is one of the biggest journals in uh, pediatric critical care in the world. Um, currently, she's got over 8,000 followers on um, Twitter and um, has published extensively on this subject. So uh, that's enough from me, I think. What I'm going to do now is hand over to Sapna who is going to take us through the next half an hour, 35 minutes of 
um, her views on social media and then we'll have questions for her at the end. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much to all of you. It's an honor to be the first international speaker um, for the Gosh Grand Rounds. And I'm really excited to talk about um, something that I'm extremely passionate about. Thank you to Sherry and Craig and the entire group at the Learning Academy for inviting me to talk about social media for medical education. Are you ready to be a tweetiatrician? And I want to I want to um, make sure that I mention that I'm not specifically focusing on pediatricians. Um, obviously, a children's hospital is a very interprofessional environment uh, across the board with multiple specialties and disciplines. And the goal is to get you acquainted with what the opportunities are on social media for everyone um, who works in a children's hospital. So first of all, um, I would like to talk about the hashtags that are most um, valuable and important to me. So first of all, this is the, one of the talks that it's okay to be on your phone and looking at social media. I encourage you to do so, to explore while I'm talking about the different uh, benefits of using professional social media. So my specific hashtags that I'm very focused on are PEDS ICU, ICU rehab, PEDS ANES or PEDS anesthesia, and also illness doesn't mean stillness. And obviously, Right now, a very topical um, area is COVID-19, and we will get into the nitty gritty of what that means and how you can get engaged um, at the end of the slideshow. So obviously we're in a very different time. It's, um, it's a new paradigm in how we share information and how we meet. And so while there are many downsides to the pandemic, and I would obviously love to be in person um, at Great Ormond Street talking about social media, uh, we have an opportunity to make it happen very quickly. And um, team meetings are essentially this, and we've gotten very used to this paradigm. Uh, one of the benefits, though, for all of you is I'm not giving this talk from my bathroom. Um, a little known or maybe not so little known fact is that I was uh, COVID-19 positive. I um, became positive um, five days after it was declared a pandemic by the WHO. I went into isolation and during my recovery, I actually gave two grand rounds from my bathroom because that's where the lighting was the best. But today I'm out of my bathroom. I am giving this talk from my office and it's a pleasure to be with all of you. So what is the definition of social media? Social media means a lot of things to a lot of different people. It's a form of electronic communication through which users create online communities to share information, ideas, personal messages, and other content. That's the Merriam-Webster formal definition. But I think when we often have this notion of professional social media, the first reaction that many people have is this. And I can tell you when I started becoming very passionate about this and started to try to share this information with the rest of my colleagues in pediatric critical care, for example, this was a common reaction. And you can't blame anyone for having that reaction because first of all, social media can be overwhelming. And the number of different platforms that are out there in terms of engaging on social media are vast and they all have different general purposes. And these are just a smattering of some of those social media platforms. So there is no question that there is the good, the bad and the ugly of social media. We see it on a daily basis, often from leaders in the international community, um, often from our own colleagues. So today what I'd like to focus on is the good. How can we use social media to have a positive impact in our medical professional careers? So my pediatric critical care community, fortunately, doesn't find social media so scary anymore for professional reasons. So I'm gonna use Pete's critical care as one example of how a community can come together um, and burst out of their bubbles. So just one month of using our hashtag Pete's ICU, we have seen 32.7 million engagements in the last month. So what does that mean? That means that 32.7 million times pediatric critical care content came across someone's feed and was viewed by that person. So that's a lot. Um, 11,300 tweets, but the number that I'm the most excited about is this one right here, 3,414 participants. Pete's Critical Care is a very small community, yet we have this vast number of participants from across the globe engaging in conversations specific to the kids we care for. So what I'd like you to do is help me help you with your career development and uh, listen to ways that social media can potentially add to your own career development and um, professional aspirations as well. So today's objectives, we're going to talk a little bit about the background and perspective on the evolution of social media use for professional and medical education reasons through the lens of both Pete's critical care and COVID-19. 
um, and also discuss applications of social media to benefit the general pediatric healthcare community. So what has social media done for you lately? Let's talk about some of the things that are major positives. There are four major components of how social media can be used for professional benefit. A, it can be used from a learning perspective, and we're going to focus heavily on that today. Teaching is another key component. Uh, treating, engaging with patients about care. There's a big caveat there, though, and protecting and controlling your own online reputation. For the purposes of today, we are not going to talk about this notion of engaging directly with patients. That's a very complex topic um, today. And for those of you who are new to the social media realm for professional reasons, I'd like you to think about how you're going to use it to share information and uptake information and also to protect and control your own online reputation. Social media is essentially a mechanism to disseminate info to patients and healthcare professionals. That is why I use it. And Twitter is a very powerful tool for networking and collaboration while participating in conversations that are really relevant to the latest research, to patient advocacy, and current controversies. So why Twitter? It seems like almost everyone is on Facebook, right? So Twitter is a way to complement our lifelong learning in real time. The way that the Twitter platform is set up is for us to have um, almost instantaneous and immediate updates on areas that are relevant to us if we curate our information correctly. We can initiate new collaborations, interface with the international pediatric um, community and beyond. So I have a list of hashtags there. These are just some examples of communities that you might be interested in engaging more with. It's an important part of being part of timely and relevant conversations, enriching conference experience or long distance participation using hashtags at conferences like ESPIC 19 and um, Pediatric Intensive Care Society meetings. And finally, the ultimate goal is to expand your education, clinical and research network and disseminate science and get out of your bubbles. We're all in a bubble, we're all in a silo. And I think that's critically important for us to understand. I'm in my Johns Hopkins bubble, my United States bubble, and before I was on social media, I remained in those bubbles. Yes, I would read about other things that were happening, probably in a very delayed fashion, but my international networking community goes far beyond the walls of my hospital. This is just one example of the global interaction in the pediatric critical care community and where my followers come from. So you can see that there are followers from every continent across the globe, which means that I have a connection to these people regardless of how far away they are, what time zone they're in. Uh, this is a quote from a uh, foreword that we wrote in 2017 with Pat Kohanek, who's the editor-in-chief of Pediatric Critical Care Medicine, and I think it really highlights the key component. It is evident that we have so much to learn from each other, and the cycle of local to global communities of practice can be fueled by leveraging social media. So should you use Twitter? The answer is yes. Primarily, you should all be using Twitter for a multitude of reasons, one of them being we don't want you to have FOMO or fear of missing out. According to the Urban Dictionary, it is the state of mental or emotional strain caused by the fear of missing out, a compulsive concern that one might miss an opportunity or a satisfying event. There is a lot of awesome things happening on Twitter related directly to your specialty, and I promise if you start to check it out, you will be amazed by the number of resources, and we're going to cover a few of them today. I want to be clear that this talk isn't specifically for the Twitter neophyte or the person who doesn't have an account. There's something here for everybody because there are many different levels of social media engagement. So level one is the observer. And many of you today hopefully will become the observers, watching the conversation from afar or simply lurking to decide if it's interesting. Uh, level two is actually starting to follow, following brands, following organizations. Number three is engaging. Um, those of you who are already using social media professionally might be doing this, clicking on content, reading, viewing. Level four is endorsing or actively sharing that content. And finally, contributing. Not just uptaking the information, but also contributing to the dissemination of that information on a broad level. So Twitter often can be overwhelming to people because of the code. There's so many different words. What's a hashtag, um, et cetera. So let's, let's break that down a bit. If you're interested in reading more, this is a great article that um, we wrote back in 2018 in terms of the nuts and bolts of using social media. It is geared to the critical care medicine community, but there's an entire section just on the basics of how to start a Twitter account 
and what you should be thinking about. And I should note that Byron Call, for example, the second author on this paper, I had not met him and we wrote this paper purely because of our connection on social media and was able to collaborate and we continue to be close collaborators. This is an example of the social media post that we put out after this paper came out online and we'll break down some of the components of that in a second. Um, and this is a table from that paper that goes through all of the different terminology related to Twitter. Handles, followers, hashtags, most of them are pretty, um, pretty logical. For example, a retweet is sharing someone's post and just putting it out there. So I'd like to give a shout out, first of all, to um, one of the amazing Twitter accounts at your own hospital, which is the Gosh Cardiorespiratory Physiotherapy Group. Um, they, I guess recently there was a horse um, that came to visit outside the hospital. And this is an example of really a perfect post. Obviously, um, they're promoting something incredible that they're doing um, within their group and at the hospital. Um, they tagged Great Ormond Street as a hospital account, as well as Park Lane Stables and um, another individual, and used a key hashtag. So all a hashtag is, is a keyword. Just like when you write a manuscript and you put it on PubMed or Medline, you want someone to find your article because of a specific keyword, that's exactly what a hashtag is. So a hashtag is a way for us to curate content around a specific area. And a username is just an account, either an organization or an individual. So those are the two basic definitions that it's important to understand moving forward. So just a brief history of how I became so passionate about social media. As of 2016, I really wasn't that heavily involved. However, my mentor, Dr. Dale Needham, who is um, you know, a huge champion and leader in the adult uh, ICU rehab space, had started a hashtag for ICU rehab. And I was seeing the amazing interprofessional collaboration that was occurring around that hashtag, and I got a little jealous. I said, my pediatric critical care community doesn't have that. How can we make it happen? So um, through the American Academy of Pediatrics, we had a social media ambassador program. We actually started this hashtag Peds ICU. And hashtag Peds ICU was really <laughs> me going from conference to conference with a couple of colleagues talking about why people should use social media. And often I got a little, a lot of strange looks, but it ended up paying off because at one of these conferences, um, Dr. Pat Kohanek, the editor in chief of Peds Critical Care Medicine said, you know what? Let's find out how we can capitalize on social media for the journal, which gave an incredible platform to this initiative. So some things we've done at PCCM, just to, as an overview, um, we focused on very consistent and time sensitive tweeting. Uh, we want to engage our authors, obviously, authors know best the message that they want to share with regards to their article and that's very important to me that we share that um, we have a lot of editors highlights we use content specific hashtags so that we're not just in our bubble of the peace critical care community we use image rich tweets and we time for international viewing again i live in the united states and it might make a lot of sense for me to tweet at 1 p.m on the Eastern um, Standard Time Zone. However, that's not as convenient for my international colleagues. A lot of people are already in bed um, or they're just waking up. Uh, so we have to think about our international community. And this is my incredible social media ambassador group. Um, and um, many of the folks you probably recognize um, from your own Pete's Critical Care community. I'm, I'm just um, really grateful to everyone here who has done an extraordinary job of sharing information across the globe. So where are we today? Well, because we began this initiative back in 2017, we're from 742 followers to 8,600 followers, and average PCCM social media content views per month are 7,630 when we first started to 150,000 per month now. So what's happening? The information that's coming from our journal is getting to the people at the bedside who are making a difference for patients. And that's really, for me, what social media is all about. So let's talk a little bit about LEARN, using Twitter for medical education, which is interacting, information gathering, research, and continuing medical education. I think one of the most common ways people enter into the, into the Twitter sphere, the gateway drug, if you will, is live tweeting the meeting. So many conferences have their own hashtag, and that hashtag is a way to engage with other people at the conference, but also, and especially now that more conferences are moving to virtual in the pandemic era, um, engaging with people who aren't even at the meeting or on an international level. Uh, so there are people who are on this call right now who I was able to tweet and interact with, even if they couldn't make it to Orlando to be at the Society for Critical Care Medicine meeting. And we had over 100 million impressions this year at the SCCM meeting, just as a testament to what social media engagement can do. But this, 
this is the area where social media, if you want to take one thing away, can be the most beneficial. How do we keep up with the extraordinary amount of literature that's coming out on a daily basis in our specialties? I would venture to say none of us feel like we know every single paper that's relevant to our field or our research every single minute because it's really hard. The rate of new content, even over the last couple of decades, has doubled and the increasing number of journals, especially in oncology and other areas, has, has really made it hard to keep up with all of the research that's out there. And I tweeted this out yesterday. I've been trying to keep track of all of the PEDS ICU COVID-19 um, material that's out there. And you can see that this was just, that there's three different photos here full of lists of articles. And these were just the articles that came out over the weekend that were directly relevant to pediatrics and COVID-19. So you might think that social media might be overwhelming because it's giving you way too much information at once but if you curate your social media presence it can actually be an outstanding way to filter your content to make sure that you are following people with similar interests and your network is bringing relevant content directly to you there's no question that all of the journals um, that are very high impact have very high presence on social media. And this is just a, just a smattering or an example of a few. And obviously your subspecialty journals also have social media presences, which I encourage you to seek out. And um, right there in England, we have PICU Journal Watch, for example, uh, run by Hari Krishnan, uh, who there are people who will curate the information for you. So this isn't COVID specific, this is one year worth of um, PEDS ICU articles that Hari put together um, with, and made sure that everyone kind of agreed that these were the most important articles that came out in our field and they're curated and sending out. And it, this tweet went viral because people appreciate having information curated for them because it takes time. It takes a lot of effort. And uh, this is just an example. And again, I cannot claim to put every single medical education resource out there on my Twitter um, slides. However, here's just a few highlights of groups that are doing extraordinary work for free open access education or medical education. So there's Don't Forget the Bubbles. They have an amazing website, but they also have an incredible social media presence and I encourage you to follow them. Open Pediatrics, um, Pediatric FOMED, uh, the PigPod podcast for those of you who are interested in peds critical care. The opportunities are endless and literally at your fingertips. The other thing that I think often we forget about is that there's a lot of stuff happening in other specialties that are directly relevant to us, but we're not always aware of because we're, we're in our bubbles. So the American Statistician, not typically a journal that I read on a daily basis. However, they had an incredible overview of data organization and spreadsheets. And this, again, tweet went out and it went out of the statistical community bubble because it was something that was directly relevant to trainees, to junior, even senior faculty doing research, because often setting up a spreadsheet is one of the most challenging barriers in getting research going and doing it well. Let's talk a little bit about COVID-19 and the literature that is coming out. I think you would all agree that it very much feels like a fire hydrant in the last three months of uh, papers that are coming out that are directly relevant to coronavirus 2019. So in the PEDS critical care community, because we already had this um, curated group of people who were engaged and actively involved, when the pandemic was announced on, four days later on March 15th, we started promoting the use of hashtag COVID-19 in collaboration with hashtag PEDS ICU so that we could start to cohort the information all in one place so that we could start to share on an international level what we were doing both clinically, but also the evidence and the data that were surrounding it. So this is the hot off the press article that came out last week of our findings from using social media for rapid information dissemination in a pandemic. So what did we learn? Well, what we learned is that we had an extraordinary increase in the number of users that were using social media to learn about COVID-19. So you can see here the SCCM Congress had many, many, many tweets, but not as many users, only 1,000 users. However, we made this announcement, people started using COVID-19 and PEDS ICU together, and then when the hyperinflammatory syndrome was announced by NHS England, it, it went viral and people really started paying attention and realizing that there is a way for us to follow this information and get updates in real time. This is just a list of um, the top 10 links 
that were of most interest on social media. Social media can tell us a lot about what people are excited and passionate about. And these are the links that people were going to the most frequently to learn about COVID-19 and peace critical care. These were the hashtags that were used most commonly. And again, what the hashtags told us is this isn't just a lot of nonsense banter about COVID-19. People are talking about this, the clinical experiences, the scientific information that's coming out. This is a reliable source of information. And we also created a network map. We were able to show that these are the people and the organizations that are highly engaged in social media. I know Andrew Tagg is on the call. He's over here in this network. And it's just an um, incredible group of people who are constantly sharing, disseminating information. And a lot of observers that we don't see in this node because they're just taking in the information. The power of a hashtag. Hashtag PedsICU had a huge week when Pick Society tweeted out this announcement from NHS England about, uh, about the hyperinflammatory syndrome that we all are learning more and more about on a daily basis. This tweet itself had 7 million views across the globe. So our conclusion, I'd just like to read it very quickly because I think this is critically important. As each PICU and hospital tackles the challenges and needs of their patient population during the pandemic, the collective experience of our colleagues across the globe can and should be leveraged in real time through the power of social media. Thus, it's imperative moving forward that our pediatric critical care, replace that with any other specialty, fami leaders familiarize themselves with social media as an essential resource to ensure that we have reliable content expertise and international representation. As the digital footprint of the PEDS critical care community grows, social media is a central component of the educational armamentarium for interprofessional staff caring for critically ill patients worldwide, both during and beyond a pandemic. Without social media, there is no way that we would have learned so quickly about what you all were dealing with in England and across Europe with regards to coronavirus because it reached us later. And so we were already learning from all of you thanks to social media and all of the different outlets surrounding that. So um, I would also like to focus a little bit on how we teach. So we talked a little bit about learning. So what about teaching? How can we share information on social media? One of the reasons I love social media from a professional perspective is it enables me to sing from the rooftops. Again, my institution, my hospital knows I'm very passionate about ICU rehab and I can talk about it all the time, but if it stays within the walls of the hospital, it doesn't have any benefit to the larger pediatric critical care community. So as scientists, as clinicians, it's our job to sing from the rooftops, not just to our own colleagues, but also to make sure that politicians, government agencies, advocacy groups learn about the hard work that we're doing to improve the care of children. I would venture, and I know there's probably some science communication um, advocates on the on this Zoom call, communicating our science is not just about self-promotion. I think that's a concern that a lot of people have. If I tweet out my paper, people are going to think I'm bragging. It's really our duty to do it responsibly because otherwise we're complicit as scientists if we say that the public doesn't know enough about our science or the public doesn't understand what we're trying to accomplish. This is a great article that came out in Nature on May 5th, Going Viral, How to Boost the Spread of Coronavirus Science on Social Media. As you all know, there's a lot of misinformation out there about COVID-19. And as scientists, there's been a huge push for us as clinicians on social media to make sure that we're sharing as much reliable information as possible. Because if we overflow social media with reliable information, that misinformation will start to get buried over time. So disseminating our research, again, as I mentioned, all these journals have very, um, very high profile presence on social media. And if you have a Twitter account, it enables you and others to share your work and it creates a direct conduit to you as an author. There's nothing that um, troubles you, me more when I see a very high impact, important paper and the first author doesn't have a Twitter handle. That means there is no direct conduit to reach that author on the social media uh, premise. And I'll give you a great example of someone who did the opposite of that. Um, and the key is, again, when I write a paper about ICU rehab, it's not so that someone else will cite my paper. That's great if they cite my paper in the future, but that's not going to happen for probably six to 12 to two years. Um, six to 12 months to two years. However, if I tweet out a paper, that information is getting to clinicians at the bedside instantaneously so that they can take it in and determine how it applies to their own practice. 
So this is just an example of how we tweet at PCCM. This is the anatomy of a tweet. You can see we use content-specific hashtags. We reference the authors if they provide a Twitter handle. This is from Martha Curley's group. Um, we link to the editorial. The editorials often get buried. Uh, I'm sure you've seen um, and not always get as much attention, but often they have the, the best parts of the article within. So it's really important for us to share that and including key figures and tables. It's important to note that highly tweeted articles are 11 times more likely to be cited and articles that are randomized to getting promoted on Twitter receive nearly three times as many page visits compared to controls. So you might say, okay, well, if someone's, something's really popular on social media, it's more likely to be cited. And that's absolutely true. Um, and what we've seen downstream is that those articles that do have social media presence um, are more likely to be cited. However, tweetations, as we call them, are also more likely to occur earlier. So I will give you a perfect example in a moment. So this was a, the paper that we published on social media. This is how we promoted it. And obviously within 24 hours, it was getting a lot of, um, a lot of uh, positive impact on social media because we were preaching to the choir in that sense. But we also started sharing it outside of the social media realm. Here is an example from a very exciting uh, collaboration, um, very close to your home. Um, and this is, this is an article that came out yesterday, Clinical Characteristics of 58 Kids with Pediatric Inflammatory Multisystem Syndrome Temporally Associated with SARS-CoV-2. So hot off the press. This is as hot off the press as it gets. So Liz Whitaker Wild um, tweeted this out yesterday at 11.26 a.m. my time. It's the same day that the paper came out. And she tagged all of the relevant organizations, including Great Ormond Street, which is a part of this collaboration. And within 24 hours, it had an alt metric score, which is a social media attention score of 151. So what does that mean? That means it's in the top 5% of all research metrics that are scored by alt metric. And within 24 hours, you can see there's 15 million articles that have been ever tracked by alt metrics. It's already number 120,000. And I just looked this morning and that number continues to get lower and lower and lower, which means that this article made a huge impact instantaneously the minute that it came out. And you can see the geographic breakdown. Social media is the best way to get it to people across the globe. So how does this all apply to you? So in the last five minutes, I'd like to focus on some interesting uh, and important ways that you at Great Ormond Street can use social media and make it directly relevant to your professional development. So first of all, I talk about getting out of your bubble, but there are some spectacular examples right there at home. And again, I did not capture all of the wonderful institutional accounts that are already out there. However, you can learn a lot about what's happening within the walls of your hospital by following these accounts. It's really important for us to share our successes and start new collaborations. Obviously, we want to promote our own departments and our own colleagues. So grants, publications, training and junior faculty accomplishments, increasing the visibility of our field, connecting with researchers outside of our specialties, and sharing our personal perspectives. So this is an example Mark Peters um, recently tweeted out um, from the Gosh um, Nursing uh, Group uh, about uh, an amazing acknowledgement that they deserve. So um, tweeted this out. And this is, again, a wonderful example of promoting your colleagues. Um, Constantine Canaris uh, tweeted this out, which went viral also. It's a short collection about compassion and moral distress in the PEDS ICU. Um, that turned from into an adult ICU from a COVID-19 uh, for COVID-19 patients. I tweeted this out yesterday to celebrate a few of my physiotherapists at Johns Hopkins who are doing incredible work. I now work in the adult COVID-19 unit and the CHLA PCCM group here is promoting one of their trainees who did um, uh, had an extraordinary paper that came out as well. These are just uh, a, a few of the pediatric ICU fellowship programs in the United States. Uh, that have started their own accounts, and they're doing some really cool stuff. So for example, they're teaching, they're sharing their medical education. Think about all the whiteboard teaching that we do on a regular basis, or now on Zoom, for example. These are things that can be shared on a broad level. Welcome back to book club. This was a respiratory physiology talk. Um, what are we reading? Um, ARDS subtypes and phenotypes, sharing what we find interesting and important in our specialty doing online journal clubs. Deanna Barron's in the United States is doing an incredible job of um, curating an online journal club for our community. 
Some institutions have pathways for using social media for academic promotion, not as the sole pathway, but as a way to augment what you've done in terms of science communication. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention the importance of advocacy. So these are just a few of the hashtags that are really important to me as an individual and also as a professional and that I use frequently. Um, and there are just some examples here from the United States. Obviously, gun violence has been a major issue for us. Um, this tweet went viral from one of my peace critical care colleagues about um, tweeting at the NRA uh, because we see children after they're shot and we should never have to tell a mother that their child was shot in the United States. Um, this is about why I vax or vaccinations. Uh, Deanna wrote an article for the Chicago Sun-Times about gun violence. And then obviously Black Lives Matter has been a huge movement and we recently had white coats for black lives. So this was my recent tweet with regards to that. Social media can be used for study recruitment. So actually it's a free and easy way to get sites um, interested and involved in studies. And you can do international recruitment via that route. So the prevalence of acute rehab for kids in the PICU study, um, the EU study is actually going to be coming out, I think in the next week, um, was using social media very broadly to recruit sites. So this is just an example of how we recruited for Park PICU. So you can see here, um, check out the new Park PICU website with FAQs and let us know if your site's interested. We gave people a little FOMO by sharing a map of the sites in the United States that had enrolled. And then slowly but surely people are like, oh, well, if they're gonna be in this, I need to be in this too. Um, we had a Brazilian physiotherapist that shared a video about Park PICU and we have 30 sites enroll instantaneously after this tweet went viral. We also share our clinical progress. So um, I'm the director of the PICU UP program at Hopkins. So when our paper came out, um, I wanted to make sure I shared it with the world because it was a quality improvement initiative at my institution that might have some relevance to what other institutions are doing. So um, with patient and parent um, permission, we started sharing some of our perspectives from our patients, um, nurses, families. And before we knew it, other institutions were starting to share their successes as well. We can also have fun. Um, I heard that there was a reindeer recently at Gosh. Um, we had a dairy cow come to visit us in the hospital and uh, a rival pick you as you will um, stated that they had a therapy pony that came in, into the hospital so again we can still have fun on social media and interact and collaborate and um, do what we do best and we can also talk about things that are totally unrelated so one day i had a wonderful talk with a mentor um, who sat down with me to talk about work-life integration and um, it really meant a lot to me so I put out that perspective. So in the last couple minutes, I want to focus on protecting and controlling your online reputation. So critically, critically important. If you're going to start to make this jump into the social media realm, or you already have, remember that social media lasts a lifetime. Um, nothing you delete is necessarily deleted forever. Um, it's really important that we curate our own reputations um, online through social media. So joining Twitter, I'm not going to belabor this point. It's pretty easy. Create a professional social media name that tells us who you are and then replace your profile photo and get started. So what should your profile look like? Well, your profile picture should be a professional headshot or some other quality photo. Um, and your bio should include information directly about you. So what does that mean? So this is Michael Cabana. He's um, been he's been in the news quite a bit because Montefiore in New York City had a, um, a, very, a very high rate of COVID admissions and they've um, published significantly on this topic. So back in the day, this is what Michael's profile may have looked like. Um, and it doesn't really tell us anything about him, right? Who is this egghead? So you see just an egg, his name and his account. So you're much less likely to follow Michael at this point because you don't know anything about him. But then Michael adds a little bit more information about himself. He's a general pediatrician at the time at UCSF. Here are the areas that he's interested in. And here is an institutional account which you can learn more about him. So I just, again, there are so many incredible people doing great things on social media. Gosh, I just wanted to highlight a few of the folks that jumped out at me as having awesome profiles. So you can see here, um, you see my profile that tells you about me. And then you see your colleagues' profiles who just in a snapshot, in that brief moment, you learn exactly who these people are and what they're passionate about. 
and you're much more likely to hit the follow button to learn more about them because you know who they are. And I think that's um, one of the key take home points. Twitter can be like a fire hydrant in general. I obviously am very passionate about this. So I look at my Twitter account quite a bit because I feel as a Twitter mentor, um, my goal is to get as many people engaged as possible. You as a beginner or someone who's just starting to get more involved, check out your feed one to two times a day. Look at it in the morning or maybe before you go to bed, pick, pick some times that make sense. Um, try not to get in the habit of looking at it constantly, but even if you look at it twice a day, you can be highly engaged and an important part of the conversation. Start by finding your people. So I know that not everyone on the call here is a pediatric intensivist. I know not everyone's an anesthesiologist or a surgeon or a physiotherapist. Find your people, your interests, your organizations. There's no way I could put it all on um, in all in this talk. Diversify out of your bubble as well. And I would recommend if you've never had a Twitter account, just start by following 10 people or organizations, people that you know and trust, and start to observe how they utilize Twitter and see what resonates with you. The second thing is I'd like you to highlight or find your official hashtag. So for example, for Peds Critical Care, it's Peds ICU. Um, there's a Neo EBM hashtag. If you're interested in point of care ultrasound, it's Pocus. ECMO, nurse Twitter, IC rehab, SOMI4, PED surgery, um, the list goes on. And hashtag med ed is a very common general hashtag for medical education. The reason that you want to do that is you want your network um, to be more like employee A's network than employees B network. So what you see here is employees A network is really diverse. There's a lot of conversations and this one person, and let's say this was me, is interacting with a lot of different people. However, you can see that employee B has a lot more of the bubble aspect. There's a lot more redundant information passing from the same people over and over again. So get a Twitter account with a professional handle, follow people and thought leaders and organizations who share your interests. Please, 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 as a social media editor, what I'd like you to do is if you ever write a paper, make sure that if you're the senior author that your first author at least has a Twitter handle with a professional picture and profile so that when that paper gets tweeted out, there's a direct conduit to them. It can make a huge difference for their professional development and provide your handle when requested. Use the hashtags, tweet about other people's papers, share information that you think is important and post anything relevant to your specialty and include those relevant hashtags. So here's just some critical care journals and their Twitter account handles. For Peds ICU, I recommend if you, if you want to follow one handle other than mine, follow Peds ICU tweets. That is a bot that I've set up that only tweets out hashtag Peds ICU content. So you can see who the people are who are engaging in conversation. So think about tweeting as a cross between text messaging, instant messaging, and blogging. Your tweets are limited to 280 characters, so you're going to quickly learn the economy of thought and word. And I think that's also a very important skill and utilize helpful punctuations and abbreviations. Don't worry about the web links. Twitter will automatically shorten them. You just have to copy paste it in. This is a nice schematic that talks about some tips for great content. In the interest of time, I'm going to move on, but this will obviously be online and you can check this out. And in the last minute, I do want to talk about the 12 word social media policy that's come out from the Mayo Clinic, who's been a leader in the area of social media and professionalism. Don't lie, don't pry, don't cheat, can't delete, don't steal, and don't reveal. So to that end, my basic Twitter rules, and these are take homes, and we can talk more about this in the Q&A and moving forward. Don't ever, ever sacrifice collegiality due to a difference of opinion. Keep it professional. If you wouldn't say something in a collegial fashion in person, Twitter is not the place to do that. Don't ever give specific medical advice or try to diagnose anything online. Stay away from those conversations and focus more on sharing evidence-based and clinical experiences that can benefit all of us. Don't write about actual patients or cases. I can't emphasize that enough and I could give examples for another hour. However, even very benign things, for example, in the city of Baltimore, if one of our fellows or one of our surgeons says something like, I just got home after dealing with a horrible gunshot wound. Um, it's been a rough night. If someone tweets that out or puts that on Facebook, A, they know where they work, so they have the place. They know when it happened. It happened overnight. They know the person's a pediatric surgeon, so they know that it happened um, to a child in Baltimore City. It's very easy to start to put together all of those details to end up being a privacy violation. So stay away from that. 
you can post photos if your social media policy at Gosh allows that. You've seen some tasteful ways that people at Gosh have done that, but make sure you know your social media policy at your institution with permission from patients and families. Don't forget to cite the source. Don't tweet slides of unpublished data. And remember that a tweet lasts a lifetime. Please feel free to reach out to me on Twitter if you have any questions at all. Just for now, start lurking, checking out what's happening in the conversation. I would like to highlight some very timely resources that we've created. I would hope that you follow all of these things on Twitter, but if not, if you want to start out, these are some shortened hashtags, um, shortened um, web links that we've created in order to get to the information. All of the Peds ICU COVID content is at this web link, and then all of the pediatric COVID-19 literature that's in Medline or PubMed is here. So help me help you with your career development. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sapna. That was fascinating. So we've had a lot of questions come in. I think some of them you have answered uh, as you were going through. So I will try to avoid those if I can. And I think Craig Knott has been on Twitter as well. So I'm trying to manage the, the talk, the Slido and Twitter at the moment. So um, <laughs> you do need to be able to juggle, don't you, when you're on these things like that. Um, great. Okay. So I think just um, a lot of people worried. I mean, clearly... Uh, in, in England here, of course, we, we spell things differently than the vast majority of population over, over the Atlantic do in the States. So are there any um, hints you've got for, okay, hashtag P-E-D-S is going to be PEDS for you, but it's not PEDS for us. We are P-A-E-D-S, ICU. Um, is there any way of getting around that easily or do we need to just follow both spellings? Um, so, uh, what, so it's interesting when we started to curate this hashtag, this, this controversy came up, actually, Hari will not mind me mentioning Hari Christian and I went back and forth and he's like, well, it's P P A E D S I C U here. Um, however, uh, I guess I kind of took, I took power over it and said, I started the hashtag and this is what it already is. So I think in it for this, for the PEDS ICU specific, um, that has been adopted internationally. So I would encourage everyone to use that. I know it, it gives consternation because it's like, oh, the A is missing. Um, however, that's just, if you want to reach the broadest audience, that hashtag is established. However, if you have seen that there's not a hashtag established for your discipline yet, and you had a similar concern that I had with Peds ICU back in the day, you can register a hashtag. And um, all you have to do is go to this website called, well, just Google healthcare hashtag project. And you can register a hashtag that includes the P-A-E-D-S um, with whatever field you're interested in. Make sure it's short and succinct and easy to capture. Um, but again, um, there's a lot of variability. So check out what's out there for your specialty. For Peds ICU, unfortunately, um, that's that's kind of the our official hashtag, but there's a lot of different options. Yeah. Okay. Great. Okay. Thanks. Um, okay. So a lot of a lot of questions sort of really are the same theme about quality of um, what is on Twitter. Um, you know, how do we know that it's not false information being incorrectly spread? Um, you know, and following on that's really, I mean, how do we critically appraise information that's coming through um, medical Twitter feeds? Um, and can we critically appraise that in the same way as we do journal articles? Absolutely. I think. I think a lot of the appraisal of the medical information coming out on Twitter comes down to your networks, right? So um, obviously we in all of our communities know that there are people in our community that when they make a statement about something, it, we listen and um, they're well respected within the field and we appraise what they say with our own personal um, knowledge of the, of the field and our own biases. And I would do the same thing on Twitter. So um, if you curate your network such that these are people that you trust, you know, initially with individuals especially, it'll take some time to get to know whether these are people you even want to trust, whether these are people who put information out there that's even relevant to what you're interested in. Um, that's why I recommend that, that the new, new folks to Twitter start with the journals, Again, we've all learned that even even um, very high impact journals have uh, put out articles that have been retracted, et cetera. But I can I can guarantee you as if you're on Twitter, you'll be the first one to learn about that retraction on rounds. I may not know everything about PICU nutrition, but at least I know that there was a paper that came out this morning on X and I could tell my medical student to go read about it and come back and teach us more. So I think that the way Twitter has helped me, not just in my own specialty areas, is it has made me more vastly general, generally knowledgeable about what's available. And then you use your own um, appraisal techniques that you've used for anything else on med Twitter as well. 
Yeah, that's, that's, that's interesting. Um, but when you're choosing your hashtags to follow, um, you know, I think someone has just pointed out that, you know, that sometimes these, you know, sort of hashtags and social media uh, sort of become the, um, the medium of sort of no noisy men um, who vastly over promote themselves. I mean, and, and, and you mentioned that journals are using our metrics really to, uh, to judge themselves now. And, you know, some journals, are, the our metrics are becoming more important than, to them than impact factor is. Now, um, I suppose the question is, is that open to manipulation by people that are self-promoting themselves um, on social media? Absolutely. There, there is definitely uh, an opportunity to elevate an alt metric score simply by um, tweeting about an article or someone who has you know, a million Twitter followers, if they are going to tweet about that, obviously, it's more likely to get retweeted. However, the way that the altmetric score is formulated is very interesting and doesn't put a ton of weight on just tweets. So for example, the recent article um, that came out in JAMA yesterday about the um, uh, hyperinflammatory syndrome, that paper has a high altmetric score, not just because it was highly tweeted, but it was shared in the news media. It was um, directly relevant to the public and the news picked it up. And I can guarantee you that the news is going to pick up things that are the, have the most direct public relevance. And so Altmetric is also a great way to measure what is important, not just in the medical community, but outside of it. Mm -hmm. um, and I, so it's, it's really hard to get your Altmetric sky high just from a few people tweeting about an article. It has to be something that is more broad than that. Okay, great. Well, that's, that's quite clear. Um, and, and I think the other thing people are thinking that the, uh, Twitter, I mean, really is just like reading the you know, a very abbreviated abstracts of, of, a, of a paper. And we just, you know, reading a whole load of um, trainees and junior doctors that are not used to deep diving and, and thinking very deeply about the things that get published in, in the press or in the literature. Yes. So I, I, this is something we talk about a lot within the, the journals that I'm associated with. So both in pediatric critical care medicine and, um, and critical care explorations, we started using a lot of infographics or visual abstracts. And the, the major worry that we always have is that people are just going to look at the visual abstract or the infographic, retweet the article and move on. And clearly that is not the level of engagement that we are seeking. Um, so I think it's really, really important um, for us to encourage our trainees to do those deep dives um, to talk to them. I think there's a huge benefit in that we're all becoming more aware of a larger um, swath of information. However, uh, training our trainees, our junior faculty, ourselves to not just get the sound bite and move on is really important. Um, okay. So I don't, I don't have a, a solution for that. However, I do tell everyone that I mentor through this Twitter social media process that if it's within your specialty, you should really do the deep dive. If it's something directly relevant, you should do the deep dive. Okay. So it's okay if you're an anesthesiology trainee to spend the whole case on their telephone in theatre? <laughs> it's not okay, no, but <laughs> that's, a, that's a separate story altogether. Yeah. <laughs> okay, fine. Um, and, and a few questions about, I mean, setting up, I mean, I think you mentioned that getting a professional um, Twitter uh, handle and a personal one. I mean, you know, people are saying that, you know, if you, if you have to separate your professional and your personal life, does that mean you're not being true to yourself um, in your social media sphere? Yeah, I, I love that question. I think it's it's really important. So the I think um, it's not a question of being true to yourself. And I don't want people to think that they have to separate their personal life completely from their professional um, persona. However, I think that on Twitter, generally, people aren't doing as much personal tweeting. They, not as many people are tweeting about personal things only on Twitter. They tend to use Facebook or Instagram more for those purposes, using sharing photos of their family, sh sharing photos of what they ate last night, you know, things like that. Um, however, I think Twitter is actually an outstanding way to have a professional profile, but still share with the rest of the world and the, the trainees and young people who are following you um, that you have a normal life. And so um, if you scroll through my social media account, I recently tweeted about how my health and fitness has taken a low priority in the last three months since I had COVID working in the COVID units. And I tweeted that my my 14 year old son is now my personal trainer. And it was just a video of him um, doing jump rope. And so, you know, someone might say, oh, gosh, no one wants to see that. Well, I think that it, it adds an element to me and who I am as a person. It tells you a little bit about my family. Um, when it was Memorial Day, I, I tweeted out a video of me and my kids playing trumpet, playing taps for Memorial Day. Um, again, that's me. It's something I'm passionate about and important about. So there's ways to do it. Depends also on how much you want to put your family or your personal life out there. 
So I, I don't see any problem with it. Just um, you need to be careful about getting too much into the um, personal conversations about hot topic issues um, so that it doesn't blur your entire professional account as well. But everyone has a different way of doing it. There's no right or wrong way as long as you keep it collegial. Yeah, and I suppose there's always a risk that the patients or your patients or their families might find your, um, you know, your social media links and and disrupt disrupt them. Does that, does that happen? Has that been a problem for you guys? Um, no, and and uh, primarily because since I do most of my personal stuff on on Facebook and I am able to curate who follows me and who doesn't, Twitter is more public. There is a way to protect your account on Twitter, but it tends to say to everyone else that you don't really want to be followed. Um, so uh, generally when I think about what I post on Twitter, is this something I'm okay with the entire world seeing? And mm. if there are patients that you don't want to see this, then it's probably not a good Twitter post. Yeah. Okay. And it was interesting. I think that you, uh, you showed the, uh, you know, the change from a Twitter account, uh, which had a photo and no bio or no photo, no bio to a photo and a bio. I mean, it looked like you're going to get much more engagement from, is that general, is, that, is, is there evidence that shows that that is generally the case? You're going to get more followers if you, if you have more information about yourself? Yeah, I'm not sure that there's there's um, actual evidence um, base for that. However, I can tell you that if you if you follow me and you don't have a profile or a photo, I'm much less likely to follow you because um, it just it just means that I, I don't know um, what you represent, who you are, where you where you are. Um, and so until you start tweeting content, um, I think the more you tell people about it, the more authentic you're being. And um, I think that's a key component in my profile. I say that I'm a mom because I want I want other women in medicine who are mothers to know that I have that experience so that I can share with them as well. I get direct messages all the time from people who um, are asking me about challenging situations that I've tweeted about and saying that they're not comfortable sharing it publicly. Um, so the number of people that I've been able to connect with in that way has been really powerful as well. Yeah. Okay. That's good. And if you, you know, I mean, clearly in Europe or certainly in the UK, we have very poor teeth and we're not quite as photogenic as most of the world. Do you think we could put just a graphic up or something that would represent ourselves with with that? Would that help just as much? Absolutely. You can do whatever you like, as long as there's a likeness of you somewhere so that we can say, oh, okay, this is what they represent. I think it's absolutely fine. Great. Okay. Um, now it's very interesting about I think those those rules for Twitter that came from I think you said the Mayo Clinic because our social media policy is I, I'm feeling that it's pretty old now having listened to you and seen this talk. Um, you know they're looking at really us putting really very limited um, information out on Twitter, um, certainly if it's associated with Great Ilmer Streets. Um, I and mean, I suppose that your your social media policy must you must revisit it very quickly because things are moving so fast. Um, and who guides your social media policy in, in your institution? Um, yeah. From that point of view. Um, there, so at Johns Hopkins, there is, a, there is a social media policy. It's relatively general. Um, things that they've asked us, uh, like, for example, one thing that changed in the last uh, year or so was they, um, they've asked us not to tweet photos um, of patients, even with permission from our personal accounts, because their concern is that it could be construed as be, you know, for example, if someone called an individual physician or healthcare professional out, there could be some ramifications. Um, however, they have not set um, direct restrictions on setting up um, accounts for various divisions, et cetera. They just ask us to be professional and um, stick to tweeting um, professional things from those accounts. Uh, but again, every institution is different, and I, I hear there's so much heterogeneity in how restrictive institutions are. I've, um, and especially now, we're even hearing about some institutions that are retaliating against uh, individuals because of their uh, advocacy views or their social justice views, et cetera. So um, it's a heavy topic, and that's why um, you know I, I know that not everyone may feel immediately comfortable delving in right now. But even if you just observe what's happening, I think that adds a, a huge component to your own knowledge base and um, awareness. Okay. Now, that is fantastic. And I've been told I have to round up, I'm afraid. And we, it's just flown by. It's, um, we, we're way past the hour, which is amazing. Um, we've had about 100 people um, listening to this, and we will uh, post it on our internal and the YouTube channel, which is fantastic. But Sapna, it's just, thank you so much. That was fantastic. We could have gone on for hours talking about this, I'm sure. Um, I'm sure you've got a lot more followers now on the Twitter and introduce a whole group of people here that would otherwise not have thought about going onto social media. Um, so that's great. Thank you so much.
um, we also need some feedback about that. Okay. Um, thank you and, so much. Yeah. I just wanted to say thank you to all of you for the incredible work you're doing. I hope to come visit you in person someday um, mm -hmm. and stay safe and thanks for the opportunity. Yeah, great. Thank you very much. Um, and for those of you that are still listening, we will be, um, if you can follow the SurveyMonkey uh, link, which is going to come in a minute, uh, so you can give us some feedback, put your name in if you want to get a certificate for attendance for the RCPCH on CPD points, and we look forward to seeing you on our grand run next week, which will be on Wednesday. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Have a good week. Thank you.